Well, hello. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Wow. Basically, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show about 40 to 50 slides of paintings made since 1976. I'm, I'm leaving the curtains open for a second, so I just want to do, uh, I'm just going to do a little preamble and introduce who I am to you, okay? So thank you very much for turning up in such numbers. I've done lectures before with Ben Harvey, so, uh, so seriously, I appreciate it. Okay, uh, who am I? Right. I'm, I'm Greg Crowley, I'm a painter, that's how I describe myself. I do not describe myself as an artist, I don't want to get into that now, perhaps we'll discuss it later. During the talk, if there's any technicalities or anything you think that's a bit obscure, what the hell do you mean? Just do the old school way to say, excuse me, and then ask it that question. But I would prefer to take questions afterwards, because obviously, even though I've been doing this, I went to art school, I'll come to that in a minute, about 40, 50 years ago, I still suffer from nervousness, I find painting a very difficult business, and I think that's something that probably you guys share, or make an art generally. Okay, I was born in Rockford in Essex in 1950, I went to St Martin's in 1968. That is not St Central St Martin's, it's called St Martin's, and placing in context, you've got to remember, I was there with Bruce McLean, Gilbert and George, Richard Long, Sculpture was in the centre, but it was actually sculpture that was being driven and informed essentially by conceptions. All right? The dominant discourses at the time, intellectually and theoretically, were feminism and Marxism. This was the late 60s. I'm not going to get into the rhetoric of kind of revolution and the spring of 68. I think if you know the <coughs> history, you know it's an extraordinary time to be, as I was 18, and the world was changing, and I went to St. Martin to say it's a very, very exciting option. It's a very exciting place to say this. And it's made such an impression on me, that education, and those years, that I'm uh, here talking to you today. A bit like history sweetness. Okay. Uh, if you're a painter in 68, you were being browbeaten by the kind of constant drip drip of painting's dead, it's white male dominated. Again, the painting. I think you've probably heard it historically, and it's still being kind of chunted out today, then actually ask for your money back, okay? Because that was 40 years ago. But there was a group of us, and I'm, I'm, I'm one of that group, who were educated and brought up, brought up, educated mm. as conceptual artists. Incidentally, if your phones are on, if you just curse it, turn it off, you know what I mean. It's um, as a group of us who Although we absorbed the theoretical, the art historical, and contextual, and, and also the cultural um, people of the day, wanted very much to be painters. And the reason that people like myself wanted to be painters was because of the so disapproval. Because I believe passionately in a culture of dissent, okay? driving the digital arts, driving the creative process, not a project of acquiescence and commodity. All right? So I come from a very, very different place. Uh, and it's that sense of dissent, that sense of scepticism, and that deep sense of being basically a fan politicised in the 60s that has given me the drive and the passion to paint and do the things I've done. Very briefly, so in late 60s, it was at St Martin's, I went to the Royal College of Art, I started painting there, and uh, I think that's about the end of my academic career. I left the Royal College in mid-70s, and one thing you should know about the 70s is, and I'm just about to show you the first slide with that to know, um, it's from 1976, and I'm just going to say a little bit more context. If you were painting in the late 60s and early 70s, not only were really you regarded as a reactionary fossil generally, uh, but the, the, the model that was dominant, or the only model that was actually approved of by the, sort of, uh, the consensus, the art uh, kind of the leaders of the professionals and the education, educators was the American model, okay? So you get teachers trotting in going, well, Ben Greenberg said to me one day, and you think, Christ, if I had a quid every time I heard somebody legitimise their whatever, their nostalgia, their anecdotes with Ben Greenberg. Um, it was a time when people taught by opinion rather than by, in my opinion, by knowledge. There was a huge fracture in society, you've got to remember, there, was, there were things going on inside of it, well, probably just like World War II, it's just history we have for you guys, okay? So bear with me. But there was a group of us who decided that, and this is very, very important theoretical stuff, that 
and postmodernism was in its infancy at that time, all right? This painting is the product of two or three, for me, very big ideas and realisations. The first, one of the things that characterises postmodern culture was the collective awareness that we had choice, stylistically and culturally. The idea of authenticity was being challenged. The idea that you would wake up, you know, and be a force of nature was actually as much a cultural construct as anything I'm going to show you today, okay? Now, that, with that realisation, that for me, and I'm speaking in a very partisan sense, because I'm not here for approval or whatever, I suddenly realised that that kicked into touch the kind of the previous generation, the expressionist, the dominance, or the viability, the legitimacy of expressionism. It problematised a whole tranche of what's called authentic, if you like, first order behavioural meaning. Okay, so what do you do with that realisation? Basically, I, I found, I've, I've been through performance, I've been writing a lot, I've written plays that were played in a kind of you know, performance or performative context. But I still wanted to paint very much. And myself and a media group of friends, the Royal College Art, we suddenly decided that we would travel and look at painting. I mean, literally, it literally was self-directed. We went off. And one of the places that I went, after, I went to Russia, I've been to America, but I went to Paris by the lot. I'm not trying to endorse the speed. Trip, it's well worth, worth it. Because there I discovered the work of somebody called Leger. I discovered Cubism. I discovered the European discourse. And this is very, very important. The idea of dominant discourse for somebody of my generation is something that you pick against, right? It's not something that sort of you acquiesce to. It's something that you should be sceptical about. Anything inherited culturally, you have to scrutinize. I believe in my education, I believe I was given the tools and the political ethos and what have you uh, to, to, to go about that project. Anyway, so suddenly we came to what was, you know, if you take, I don't want to get to art history, but there's the Mondrian and the Ad Reinhardt paintings, there's a kind of end of painting, there's constant pack off on their painting being dead, etc, etc. You suddenly thought, well hold on, let's get off that script, let's think about what we want, right? Not what others want, not the painting kind of the dominant discourse or some form of 1960s critical discourse. Uh, a form of critical discourse, yeah. <coughs> so anyway, so I fell in love with the work of Ferdinand Leger. I love Leger's work, it spoke straight to me about its, uh, it, was, it was intelligent, it was that pictorial space, it had a lot of the formal qualities that I've been brought up to appreciate. Don't forget, formalists, if somebody says make it ready, move it up a bit, again, demand your money back, because that's a joke for my Idea that that is teaching, it's not, that's just kind of um, nostalgia, it's, it's, it's comedy basically. Anyway, so uh, I suddenly thought, hold on, this, this thing about originality and authenticity, and as again, you spend a whole day talking about this, so I'm going to praise it very loudly. I suddenly thought, well, hold on, I, I love the idea of Leger, the, the, the transformation of the First World War, its socialist credentials. And he still painted these paintings that were modernist from those days. Modernism wasn't, it was some was like glass knockings in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, but I still wanted to embrace it. Anyway, this is about the actual size of this painting. It's painted in 1976. And I remember that I had this need to, uh, to hang, have a hang. I didn't want to paint about a painting. I mean, I blow this is fairly formless in one sense. I wanted to paint about what it's like to be alive, I wanted to actually have ownership of my work, and I wanted my life to be my work, my work to be my life. That doesn't sound too um, scientific. Right. So, uh, I, I, you know, start, by, start painting art. I become an art, a painting group, a, paint, a fan of painting. I start to sort of look at history of painting. It was, hadn't been discussed. It was as if there was no talk about painters. It was like today, you're getting the last copy of something like the Marmite Show catalogue, or the Moors, or Peter, or whatever, okay? And you're thinking that's the book on painting. It's not, okay? It's a 500 year old discourse. And if painting is anything, it is a discourse. It is not an activity. Decorating is an activity. Painting is a discourse, all right? So I firmly believe that. And that means it embraces your every waking, thinking life, uh, your waking and, and sensing life, I read about it, I still can't 
uh, consume enough. I'm constantly curious, not just about painting, but about creativity, and, 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 and you know, that means literature, theatre, and cinema, obviously. And I'm you know, one of those guys with a huge collection of vinyl as well, and it all speaks one to another, particularly when I'm writing, by the way. I do a lot of writing, present, catalog essays for other people, particularly work that is painting or painting related. Okay. So appropriate. Now, that's a word that you guys have been obviously brought up with since year one. When Lara showed this painting, it's entitled this entitled cake, it's painted with a pointing trowel, and it's painted with acrylic paint, and it's painted with all the sensitivity that most people would under, under see of above or an old outside laboratory of paint. So it's done in this, don't forget, 76, it's also a year of punk. There's a sense of you can take culture, you can rip it up, and the more you kind of take liberties with it, the more you felt alive, the more you felt sort of contemporary in the context of it. Anyway, um, right. Right, when, when I first showed these paintings, this painting and the first three I'm going to show you, the word appropriation wasn't in the lecture, right? It's 1976. I was accused of being unoriginal, la that's right, lacking in originality, a pastiche, um, I'll give you name it, I've got all sorts of Brickbacks from the old, what I would call the existential and the romantic school of, 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 of painting or of art. Um, but, quite frankly, it didn't really bother me. The fact that I was becoming, I was being discussed, even to be kind of slagged off by a lot of people in the mainstream, that didn't really uh, concern me so much. Uh, anyway, so it, it's painted, it's part of chalk, it's a collage of canvas. Stuff on with acrylic paint, and it's, it's exactly this size. Whereas any of you know the kind of leges from which I'm borrowing, right, at the time, or referencing, but as I say, the word appropriation wasn't really in common use until the late 70s, early 80s, right, and now it's all It's kind of, you know, it's part of the kind of, it's part of your lexicon, it's part of your armor. Uh, and as I say, it happened in writing, it happened in visual arts, it happened in music. Uh, and I think at that time there was a synergy between all of those activities. There still is, in my mind. Right, the next slide. Oh no, press the wrong button. Give me a second. Ah, yes. Can you focus on a bit, one? Tighten it up. No. Tighten this. That's the that's Okay, is that, you guys, you, you be my eyes and watch it, because otherwise we're going to have more conversation about focus and the value of transparency. But as I say, I make no apologies for bringing transparency. I've used the okay, you know, projectors, digital projectors, and this would, you know, all the paintings look like they've been through the, the been bleached or been through the wash, yeah, the rinse down. So bear with the, the archaic technology. At this point, this is 1977, 78. Again, it's acrylic painting, and I'm battling to... to I, I, basically, it's a project of reclamation. I come out of a, a, a school of thought, a school of art making, and painting, that actually was all about guns. There were very few ideas about what you could do, what, you know, basically, uh, not approval, but the idea about inclusion. And so I, a small group of like-minded people, decided that this was a time of reclamation and rediscovery. Uh, cultural reclamation, which embraces ideas of identity, the European, of which we are, etc. This again is based on a kind of a, a, a leger probably from the uh, 20s or 30s and several other paintings. It references this kind of idea of the biomorphic and. Aha! Uh, uh, oh no! That's interesting. Okay, focus on that. Yeah, go on. Please. Okay, but a bit more. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's just leave it there. And don't anybody breathe out. Right, uh, this is called so and so. Uh, it's, I suddenly decided that I couldn't spend my whole life painting that painting. It's not that bloody image. I'm sorry, it just isn't. Uh, you know, uh, I wanted to paint about what it was like to be alive, not what it was like to. Be a painter. It doesn't, you know, who the hell did it then? Yeah, you've got your own lives, you've got your own problems, you don't need to share mine. And that's also another reason why the expressionist, which is really 
reinvented for the YBAs, the idea of self and selfdom and <coughs> narcissism generally is actually, from where I'm standing, politically as well as you know, structurally, uh, 64 and a half years old, it, it's an anathema. Yeah? This is the idea about what it's like to be alive, what it's like to be in this society at this time, with all the history that we carry. And painting, believe me, being 500 carries a lot of history, carries a lot of weight. I don't mean in terms of its authority, but it's just a massive stuff there. So I decided to paint about what we were doing. My wife was making things, she was sewing stuff, uh, she's a designer, you know, blah, 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 architect, does architect, something of sort of thing. Anyway, and so we had a little workshop in South East London. I was painting in this on one floor, and she was making stuff on another. We lived upstairs, etc., etc. And this is around 1980, and I wanted to make this, um, I started wanting to embrace like this, not only of the the idea of the high and low art, right? This, when it was reviewed and observed by the man called William Cleaver, he referred to it as Walt Disney meets Picasso. Now, this was the very, very first knockings of the idea of the high and low. Uh, if, if I was honest, there's nobody who would have been a lecturer in my day who knew the difference between New Order and Joy Division, all right? Okay? There wouldn't have been the difference between Rolling Stones and Beatles, or something, to put it in historical context or a break from them, you have to be fun. So that really is something that has changed for all of us. It's changed me culturally. Because I can't think about Don Van Vliet, Captain B Fart, without thinking about the innovative trap, the trap mask replica and his paintings, okay? All of this for me is grist to the mill. <coughs> anyway, so it's reviewed in, uh, it's, in the, it's in the John Moores or it's in some big competition or show. And it's, it's, it's one of the first oil paintings I made. Because uh, I suddenly discovered that if I was going to actually engage in painting, I would have to start painting. Uh, and I wanted the whole shebang. I wanted that elusive, difficult, mucky, visceral. I wanted all the stuff that painting actually could offer, right? I didn't sort of want to sort of work in a, in a, mar in, in a marginal way in a practical sense. I was very happy to work in a marginal way in terms of the greater art world, and God knows, I never gave two thoughts about the art market. It didn't actually cross my, my, my mind. Okay, so basically what I'm referring to here, and I take issue with William Fever over, is the idea of Walt Disney meets Picasso. This is George Herriman, the creator of Crazy Cat, okay, meets Miro, okay, the, with the anthropomorphic work of Miro in the sort of 30s. The other thing about this is that um, there's another art historical reference there, and I remembered it now a second ago, I've forgotten that. Yes, again, you've got to forgive me if I occasionally forget things, just put it down for ages. So it's like a Homer Simpson thing. You have know, one more fact and then you forget your name, and it's just sort of, it has happened to me all the time. Right, uh, something about the painting, <coughs> it doesn't matter. Anyway, so more George Herriman meets Nero, and it's about high and low art. The idea that culture, whether it be football, and in my case, motorcycles, the vinyl, and all the rest of it, these are all grist to the mill. This is who you are rather than who somebody thinks you ought to be. It's a difference. This is very important stuff. It took me 20 or 30 years to find out what I needed to do, who I needed to be. Right, by necessity, not and, and, and break with the idea of what I wanted or what I wanted to do or what I thought I ought to do in the way of art or in, general, in terms of social life generally. Anyway, so it's um, it's a painting. It's one of the first oil paintings I made. I'm struggling with the medium. I'm behaving as if it's acrylic. And uh, by the way, painting for me, the oil painting, suddenly when somebody said it's more like owl light. I, it's a two-pack thing, you know, there's a medium pigment in it, whereas before I was just thinning it out like it would a water-based material. But I'll talk about painting generally later on. I also decided that <coughs> I'm struggling to find a genre, and believe me, genre, uh, again, it's a whole day's <coughs> seminar on it, its own. I believe it's like gravity. There's no point having an opinion about it, because you're not going to outrun it or outstrip it, and it's, it's materials. So, I... And um, painting, irrespective of what you think about painting or genre generally, does actually come in genre. And it's very important to talk about genre because at any time, uh, historically, there will be a hierarchy in genre. Okay? 
Uh, I'm not going to get into that now, but in the 18th century, it's just a hierarchy of genre as there is in the 19th or 20th century. And so I, realising that what I would start it with was ostensibly a portrait in the last slide, completing the still life. All right? So I was, the idea of taking these two propositions, these two genres, and completing them. That is a synthesis, because there's a third element there, but the first two, the idea of completing two genres, is an academically clever But the thing that I think gives it some humanity is the fact that I decided to take my history, yeah, my love of uh, uh, Robert Crumb, I mean, and Robert Crumb incidentally is the catalyst and, and the, 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 the door to Dustin, or to Lake Dustin, like that. Uh, and the idea of comics of an X, because that was very much a part of the late 60s. Um, anyway. So, as I say, it's about taking possession, and it's about I, profound ideas rather than theorised ideas and identities. It's who you need to be rather than what you want to be, or what society you think you ought to be. And I, from that, you know, libertarian sort of thing of the late 60s, went into this business because I thought it would be about self-realisation. And to be honest, it still is for me. It's about what Aristotle called leading the good life, or a full life. Uh, not necessarily making a lot of money, <laughs> Uh, or being a celebrity, because that's all, that's, I can talk about that later if you want to, that's another issue. So, basically, this is an, an attempt at a self-portrait. Uh, what I've done is I've got, well, there's this tri triangle of the, the surface, you know, the object, the art object, the mirror has become an axiomatic part of self-portraiture, uh, and, and is part of the, you know, the optical device. <coughs> but then I suddenly thought, well, how am I going to depict Personal. I don't actually know how to go about this. None of the models that are available are kind of credible or cogent. But, and I wanted to make, I was in a show, by the way, called um, oh, some comic, something to do with, I've forgotten the title of the bloody show. It was at the ICA, two in North America, and one guy reviewing it in Time Out or something, and came to London, said something rather, this show about comic art is high, it's ran full of clever academics from North America critiquing kind of popular culture. The only painting in the show that's remotely fun or absurd is Ray Crowley's 3D, as in 3D pencil. And, you know, I don't have to be a boy who's work out the thing about the pencil and the nose and that and all that stuff. But the thing that I particularly enjoyed, two things about it, is if you look down the bottom corner, just by the by, there's a chair that's behind that tablet, it's wood. And that is painted in oil paint using just oil with things like charcoal grey, paint grey, I'll talk about them later on. These are glazing colours. Because the one thing about painting is if the dominant model was Ala Prima, that came from the legacy of expressionism. Uh, and here was a way of painting that was sort of pre delicate pre sort of proto modernist, pre Manet, you know, etc. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the fact that I've managed to work in a reference to the Flintstones in that the self portrait is essentially Barney Rob with those wonderful vacant eyes, the reprint. You know, that kind of sort of dirty. Aspect of culture. This is, oh, this incidentally is the other painting, which is called a Griseide, 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 depends which continent or language you speak, that's it. Uh, and this is painted with charcoal grey and paint spray, and uh, another painting white, but it's painted in an opaque way. It's entirely tonal, as I say, the only bit that really, that little chair out there, swoon, out there, is the bit that sort of, is the bit that suddenly. I, I discover something liberating about painting, this idea of this medium being uh, a bit like a relationship rather than simply a tool or an implement. Okay? This is, uh, ah, and then this goes a little bit further, but what I, what I suddenly realised is that not only have I conflated the portrait with the still life, I'm actually backed in, and this is how a lot of things happen or happen to me. It is that I back into things and I suddenly find that what I'm dealing with is anthropomorphism, the idea of imbuing the inanimate with human or animate characteristics or uh, elements of the, the human. So here, there's one day, this is shown in the show in London, there's a couple of painters and some writers come up, and one of the guys said to me, this is, this is how, I'm sorry, it's evidence about how dumb you can be or how behind your own curve you can be. And they say, oh, Graham, that's fascinating, that reside, that tinted reside. It's a flagellation, you see. 
So you've got to learn, I think it's about three weeks from here. Okay, this is called the Founder, from calling, from London calling, in fact, what is it, 1980, 81? Okay, uh, and here, again, the anthropomorphism, the idea of, yeah, that's, I mean, that's not sort of high art or anything, I don't remember perhaps, but the idea of the saw teeth and the kind of more, this toothless sort of uh, mask, like the tragic comic mask uh, of classical the theatrical or Greek theatre, is something that's been referenced. But this painting, there's a little bit of wood looking again, being interrogated, for want of a better word, in, in the vice. Um, and this painting, I, I think was about this time I first showed New York, and particularly things begin to travel and happen. Uh, by the way, you can see the outside world there is beginning to rely on almost a much, a much more inclusive, a much broader range of uh, painted devices and techniques, and also historical references. But this painting was sold to a bloke in Indianapolis who owns a tool company, and he collects paintings of tools. <coughs> this is a bit like sort of people who get stamps that only goes with, I don't know, trees in them or cheese or something. I mean, it's, it makes the idea of the arbiter of taste, you know, what it is, absurd. Anyway, he wrote back to the gallery shortly after buying and said they weren't very keen on the political connotations of the clan there, right? Oh, sorry, you don't like the title? Well, <laughs> you know, like, like the rat's ass. They call it Mayhem Workshop. And you think, oh, Christ, you know, if ever a piece of work has been emasculated or, you know, or somebody's put the dampeners on it, that was it. That wasn't the first time that would happen. Anyway, so, and they're actually about actual size of these, so about three foot by four foot. Uh, I think that could do the that, That's nearly there. That's it, that's nearly there. Okay, this is the greater picture as a cheese grater. Oh, it's a pun, how very clever. But quite frankly, you know, sometimes it, what would I think? Why don't I just call it still life or untitled 47? That I wouldn't have to be embarrassed by saying it's the greater picture. But the thing was, it was, again, you'll see in a minute, it's white underpainting with a tiny bit of paint spray. Gradually, the paint spray is left out of the other painting. I'll like paint these white paintings uh, with other painting white and then glaze them all. The, the, when you see this painting, in fact, I think it's evident in the slide, that in actual fact, the use of the medium and the oil is a bit like sort of chip fat in the whole thing, right? It's not that sort of, you don't want to look behind the cooking experience. Okay, right, here we go. Next slide. Oh, and this one. <laughs> This one was shown in some uh, group show at uh, the Walker Art Gallery in about 84, 85. That's a stencil in myself, you know, rolled out, zoned uh, out in front of the telly with that light that sort of flickers and fades. But the most exciting thing for me as a painter was the painting of the city there. And don't forget, we're at the end of Thatcher's sort of time, John Major's in, there's a lot of rhetoric about Victorian values, back to basics. The painter, or the artist, and he's an extra engraver who's informing the work at this time. Is a guy called Gustave Doré. Okay. Now, if you ever, if you've never heard of Gustave Doré, you will do, or you've already seen the work of Gustave Doré. Every time there's some historical program or whatever about London, you see, you know, talk about the urban poor, right? In the 18th and 19th century, Gustave Doré comes. Now, Gustave Doré is so important. The other painter, the other etcher engraver who you've never heard of probably, is a guy called Thomas Pruitt. He defined, one of the first people to define the idea of the English dissident beyond the idea of the grandiose, uh, you know, things like um, Blake and so on. All right? Over the Right. This was shown in Liverpool. Uh, it was very much that sort of high art, low art thing still going on, particularly in my work. And uh, the curators. No, oh, it was the, the guy. The guy wrote a letter to the gallery's representative at the time, and, and the bloke in the letter had gone to the lecture saying, "I find most of the work in this show uh, facile, <coughs> contemporary, and modish, and this, that, and the other. And it's all sort of, it will blow away in a few weeks, and the dust will, you know, blow away." But he said, "I must admit," he said, "one one thing that did actually take my attention, or was the morning after the show, was when I went down into my kitchen to do the washing up from the night before." And uh, suddenly had the very idea that it might be drowning. This idea of this sense of anxiety projected onto the objects around us, the anthropomorphic. Okay? Oh, that's, uh, that is testing how those drawings are made, okay? So what I would do is I'd make a drawing of a pot in, in, a, in a space, and then I would 
cut it above and break the drawing up. I, I know it sounds literalist and pedestrian, but it was, it was a beginning, the way of actually making and combining the idea of drawing, the pictorial, and, 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 and ideas. And, and, and the central thing is the idea of pictorial space, which is until <coughs> to, uh, the end of the 19th century, it was fairly, well, uh, it's getting too hard historical, isn't it? Because I think it's Yotto. <laughs> and come back again. But uh, basically, Cubism changed everything. That's, you know, all of it, particularly for my generation. And I think it paints the subsequent. Right, so what I did was I was painting about the idea of, I wanted to paint paintings that actually had, that touched real politics, that touched the idea of our lives, and, and the kind of social and political cast of the day. And I, I remember Mrs. Thatcher bought a bar at home, and I thought, that is, that is so much, you know, you couldn't write this stuff. Fred Barrett obviously got the knighthood, or the Lord Barrett by now, or whatever, and he owned half a hatcher anyway. And he built this estate in South East London, probably been past it, near Dulwich School. It's on the South Circular, and uh, it has a gated community. It's one of the first gated communities. I, we, you know, the, we don't want anything to do with you, the outside world, the poor, and the dispossessed, you can solve off. You know, just, just don't come near our place. And she bought a house there, it doesn't seem to occupy it, but at the same time, us, there's a whole is set of issues. It, the Cold War that we get still going on, massive paranoia about the bomb and about annihilation, you know, uh, which for me hasn't actually gone away, kind of thing, do it. Um, I don't seem to get much relief from it. And so I suddenly thought, how the hell can you work about you know, environmental or political issues without some sort of wagging the finger at being slightly sanctimonious? Because it's always, and this is really hard to imagine. There are a lot of people out there, when you're working, when I'm working, and you cannot imagine what it's like to be brighter than you are, or better informed, or to know stuff you don't know. Okay? It's just, it's, it's been a bit of time. And I, if there's one person who I reference all the time writing, it's Wittgenstein. Not trapped artists, and I want to get into the heavy, you know, the kind of snow shifting end of it, but the later work, which I would say was more lyric work, and perhaps the most mystical position. Oh, this, this slide starts with the boil. Can you take it down quickly? It's festering. At the centre, you can see there's a whole load of bubbles and on So, too much talking to you. Okay, basically, what I'm quoting from there was um, uh, <coughs> Anderson. Uh, not Lindsay Anderson, the guy who made all the wonderful um, international rescue, etc., etc. <coughs> quoted a lot in um, Work in Park. Uh, it doesn't matter. But Jerry Anderson, yes, that's right. The idea that, because I'll, I'll, I think the one thing I forgot to mention was I'd had a little boy at the time, and uh, we had a little boy at the time, and uh, it was about the domestic, and increasingly the work moves towards the idea of, uh, let's say, family, what it's like to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, listen, uh, you've got to realise, I mean, for years, probably until mid 90s, I never had what's called a regular job. I would be hand to mouth, showing to hopefully find myself in painting. Yes, traveling around the country, talking about the work of teaching and stuff, and doing residencies. Uh, and so, money was very difficult, and ideas of insecurity, you know, in a very profound sense, uh, were, were there all the time. And they, became, they came to the fore when I had children. And so I started painting a whole series of paintings. This one's called The Poetics of Space, which if any of you know you're a French sort of structuralist, you know that that's the title of a book by a man called Gaston Bastard. Thank you. <laughs> now that was one of those wonderful books. There's, if you just read one passage from the, from the basement to the garret, it's about signification, it's about the idea that objects have a life of their own. Yeah, you know, when you see things in, uh, I don't know, car boot sales or jumbo sales, you think, oh, that's kind of bourgeois, that's kind of, well, that's kind of sort of, that's kind of sort of, that's shabby, that's this, that, the other. Do you know what I mean? You attach meaning. You may attach value, so you attach meaning to something. Anyway, this is ostensibly a triptych. It's called, what did I say? No, uh, okay, thank you. Somebody looks this thing. The very to space. Uh, and, and it's, as, it's very slightly asymmetrical because it's not about religious triptychs, you know, where the doors would fold in and so it has to be, you know, it has to be symmetrical. 
and I didn't want any of that kind of connotation. It's had to be a secular humanist form of cryptic. Uh, and anyway, you'll see in a minute, it's all white on the painting, it's a glaze, but then I suddenly realised that by glazing, you could actually paint the smell of something. You know, the way that sort of cooking or sort of the stale washing or damp, damp cats and dogs can actually infect a whole room, yeah, and still be in that room a week later, sadly, and I know my experience. Uh, it's ostensibly a self-portrait. The one thing that fascinates me in this painting and uh, the next one I'm going to show you, right, which is called uh, Peripheral Vision, where the asymmetry is more pronounced. And the luminosity here of what looks almost like a fire burning downstairs reaches a pitch that I still think today is something I, you know, when you see these paintings, you see them exhibitions, they sort of look like somebody's thrown a three kilowatt fire in a glass or something. It's got that kind of sort of presence. And all those funny little white dots are testimony to the underpainting. So there's this rather fascist, sort of rich sort of underpainting, <coughs> and then it plays. And when I say the smell of cooking, you can see that although they're essentially three panels, the imagery is joined by the idea of the colour and the glazing. And the reason for the, the, the way that that's done, okay, focus up from that's that done, do exactly as this. This is the same painting, uh, and what I've done is I've spent probably a month or two doing the other paintings. So the whole of the imagery, yeah, as I say, down to the eyelashes almost, everything's there, it's done in, in detail. I think this one might be starting. Some of these older slides will have problems with, with overheating. Uh, anyway, so, and then I glazed it with something like burnt umber or burnt sienna into cerulean blue. And, and there's a second glaze on that window there. And so the whole thing is a white impasto, which is left to dry, and then the whole thing is covered with varnish. It's a, a, a polarised gel, which I'm not going to get into that now, but later on, uh, called liquid. And pour it all over the whole thing. And then a tiny piece of pigment probably it wouldn't cover your fingernail, is put down here, which is, the, the, and the reason behind that is it's the most distant place from the light. And this is a light that is actually being constructed. This is not light in any mimetic sense. This is not realism. This is not, this is synthetic figuration. And that is the only figuration for me that is viable, because for me, you cannot look at a man A and not see the object, all right? So you get that ACDC, that sort of switch between the thing depicted and the thing depicted. The painting is its own object. So that's the beginning, and then it plays a dozen more times. That kind of methodology is taken to a, another place here with one, two, three, four, five, six, six mm -hmm. about ten panels, uh, and they're, they're all separate canvases, but as you can see, they're all painted with the same glaze. There's little bars separating them. And this is essentially a house that's been taken to pieces, uh, both uh, poetically, and again, references the, the bachelor and stuff like that, the, the writing that was becoming increasingly influential at the time. And a new way of looking at the social through the idea of medical realism. Now, I know you, this is not Norwich, there's a show on Norwich, it's called Reality. It's not, it wouldn't be my idea to call a show of painting reality, but I'm not going to get into that now. It's a big survey show with Sicker, Freud, <coughs> Uh, bacon and hot, all sorts of things in it. And I'll be honest with you, it's the best thing that's happened to my CV for the last 20 years, but I'm in it as well. And it's going to the Walker next year. This painting, which is uh, about eight, six or seven foot wide, and the next one I'll show you, and this is called The Chain Store. Okay. So, alright, still that sort of poorly judged punning going on. But it's the idea, you've got, you've got to imagine that, as far as I'm concerned, we collectively, as well as we individually, we become more sophisticated. I hope that's the case anyway, or, or whatever. But anyway, this is about the transformation from the production economy to the warehouse economy. I was living in Cardiff, doing another residency at the time, and you were just, they were just emerging these out-of-town sheds, you know, the kind of Tesco, Sainsbury's, MFI stuff, that is ubiquitous these days. And of course, this was shown in one of the newspaper at the Times with a picture of me standing in front of it, grinning mainly, because we're told to do that sort of thing in pictures like that. And you think, oh, whatever. And anyway, so somebody from Kingfisher Holdings gets in touch with the gallery that represents me at the time, which is Edward Tota, by the way. That's another story. Uh, and they come to see the painting. Now, at the time, there's a guy, and it's not Edward Shaw, somebody else was done for uh, <coughs> copyright infringement. 
they use the Shell logo or something. And I thought, oh, that's great. It's a, it's a legal case study. Oh, that's, don't really need that. Because appropriation in those days was still, this is 1984, 85, it's still, you're, you're only sort of seven or eight years in. It's still, it's not become mandatory or a module at the Open University the way it is these days. Um, so, anyway, the, the, the guy <coughs> turns up at the gallery, I wasn't at the time, story goes, came there, looked at it, realised that the Texas home care centre in the, the centre was also a ruin, because there's the car with the wheels nicked off it, etc. And they decided, because they, they essentially came to buy it. That was the, the cover story. But in actual fact, they didn't do that. They came up with this wonderful bank, <coughs> how to fix it, big and poor ruin. Uh, I thought, huh, good stuff. <laughs> then, this, oh, this is an example of drawing. I was doing residency in the North, this is around 1992. And this is the other painting. This is a drawing for the other painting in the reality show that I told you about at Sainsbury's Centre for Visual Arts at UEA. And it's a housing estate, as you can see. It's called Dorman's Town. It was a sort of tied, imagine a tied cottage, but with a thousand homes and five or six thousand people all working for the steel works, which is in the top right. It's compressed charcoal, by the way, on handmade paper. Uh, and this was the site of the beginnings of the whole anxiety. It's 1990, I think. And two doctors took 110 kids into uh, local council care because they feared uh, systematic or rich abuse, as it's called in those days. And this is a painting that came from that drawing. This is, and this has the title, No Such Thing. Now, most of you probably know, do you know the, the, the roots of No Such Thing? I'll just explain it in five minutes. It's the strap line to the 80s and Thatcher years. And Mrs. Thatcher said, and this is brilliant. It was on Woman's app. It wasn't Jerry Paxman on Newsnight. It wasn't the Today programme. It wasn't something searching, etc. It was Woman's app. And Jenny Murray said to Mrs. Thatcher, well, don't you worry about the state of society, because it was a time of clothing the mines and all the rest of it. And she said in that wonderful sanctimonious way, oh, but there is no such thing as society. No such thing as society. Sorry, lady, from where I'm sitting down here, it looks like we've got to, you know, we've got to rely on each other more and more. You may have actually sort of bugger off in the green grocers or wherever it was, into the Tory party, but that's not going to be my fate. How it isn't something I have a part in at all. And the idea of disenfranchisement, marginalisation, and stuff like that have driven me ever since. So the idea of the culture of dissent, it, it, you can see it's, it's still working. It's still working a bit of a lava today. And that's 20, 25 years, 30 years after I painted the damn thing. Anyway, it's called No Such Thing, and it's the other thing. I have two paintings in this show called Reality. It's a pretty good catalogue of the. the, the, the and it's painted with all white hats and glazed with things like rose doré, uh, that wonderful Indian yellow that's, <laughs> that is so beautiful until you realise it's made out of cow piss, you know. And you think, that is actually quite like that, the idea that this exquisite pigment is made out of something that's been through a sort of cow's, sort of coming out of a cow's arse, basically. Um, anyway, very pragmatic moment. Uh, because of all this, squeezing it out and putting it on, and I like the idea. It goes back to the expressionist thing. How, what is it that's more uh, scarier, more viable, more kind of English, in a way, than uh, uh, the antithesis of expressionism, is being sort of well buttoned up. Gilbert and George had it down to a T, because that was part of their shtick as well. The idea that... Uh, <coughs> So I wanted to make paintings, all those paintings, with this white underpainting. The method was so labour-intensive that OCD doesn't begin to describe it. I hold no that in there. I got RSI, repetitive strain injury, because I'd stand there and paint and, and start painting. Oh, there's some flower paintings in a minute, and they're doing the same method. And I got this RSI, so that meant I couldn't raise my arms above here. And, I, and so I suddenly thought, Jesus, I'd rather have paint smaller paintings, stop painting or paint, painting differently. And I suddenly thought, and this is why I'm, uh, you know, what should we say, outre in market terms, I suddenly get to a position stylistically, I think, I don't want to do this anymore. I, you know, or, or I moved on, and my life has changed. Or my kids, the, 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 you know, the newness of being a house husband, or, or taking people's 
kids at school or going to parent teacher meetings and all that stuff. Those days are done. My kids, actually, one of them uh, went to Canada uh, about 15 years ago. So things have moved on. And anyway, uh, and I, we, had, we had a bunch of kids to To cut a long story short, my family from the west of Ireland and I went back there in my in 1968 and get in touch with my roots and this is, these are paintings and drawings that are about the west of Ireland and symbology within the Republican tradition you've got to keep two colours in mind orange and green okay, just keep those two colours just keep that in mind and you'll see the role they play in the fence so anyway, so I have to find a more immediate direct way of making my paintings and, uh, and there are several little stalkers. This is a canvas about, I don't know, 20 by 15 inches. It's compressed charcoal, by the way, on, and then it's sealed down with, a, actually, that's sealed with a polymerized resin. And then over the top, I put a paint with oil paint on the top. So this is a glaze of Prussian blue that's then wiped down. And this is the thing about glazing. Uh, that early, the first painting I showed you was bright. It was cadmium yellow, it was cadmium red. Chrome this high chroma, high hue colours. All the ones in study that the EU would ban very soon, by the way, if they had their way over things like cadmium and chrome, heavy metals, I think they should. That's a totally separate issue. Um, so, yes, right, and luminosity, as you'll see in those paintings where I just used the glazes, the, when paintings are luminous, that means there's a light coming from the painting. They're not bright. I mean, BMW 3 Series in lime green is bright, okay? It's high, it's a high chromatic value. But you look at Raphael, the Don of the Goldfields, or you look at Manet, and suddenly see there is a light within these things, and Aldous Huxley, <coughs> Huxley once had one of them say. He said there are two ways that humankind have developed a very, very high, rarefied ways of, of behaving, and, and it's a refraction of light, okay? And so in the first subject, don't, it's not talking about the cathedral windows of the uh, Gothic period or the, you know, the Neo-Gothic period. He's talking about the 20th century, and there are two things that are going on in the 20th and 30s when he's writing this essay. And one is the cutting of gemstones, so you can refract light. It's a rather expensive way of doing it. Or, or you can paint paintings, or you can paint as, as people did before Delacroix, right? A very, very interesting proposition. If don't get brought up as an old level modernist, the idea of looking at anything that was sort of done by dead people was a national. And I got over that years ago, I was saying, when, you know, the, the legend was he'd been dead for 20 years by the time I discovered his work. So, anyway, uh, it moves on. This is a small pack, a small drawing which becomes a painting. The idea of cultural renewal, people painting their homes. Uh -huh. And here, this is just, it's on a board, it's about 12 by 15 inches. It's Oh, Christ, it doesn't matter which yellow is. That's a load of oil, a tiny bit of pigment that's dry. Then a second pack of oil with its tiny bit of, um, <coughs> of a of some kind. And then the whole thing, and this is really important. All of the paintings I've shown you, all the ones that are glazed, all those, I spend more time with a piece of cloth around in my hand, wiping the stuff off, right? Than I do, uh, in fact, the only brush used in this are those huge brush strokes of where the things do underpainted. After that, everything else is done by reduction. Uh, it, it's, it's essentially a plein air painting, painted around about 1990 something or other, of uh, a little house where we used to stay in the summer, and that shape is where I used to paint as well. And everybody was called Crowley. This is again a similar method, but I just think there's something about this the way that the image has to be gradually, gradually condenses out of the surface, out of the object. The way that the, the, yeah, the, the thing that depicted is so uh, firmly rooted in its object group that that to me suddenly is a sort of symbol of, for me, is an affirmation of why painting is not illustration, why it's not sculpture, and why it's not, you know, that's, that's something. Well, and definitely not decorative. Again, similar method here, two, two unpaintings, so two of the browns, of what's it, of very transparent paint, and then, and this is important, but you'll see in a minute in the new paintings, I paint all of this monochromatic sort of graphic stuff, which is in terra verita, it's called. The whole, that's wet into wet. But normally, wet into wet painting, if you're thinking the 19th century, Manet and so on, or very century, that about Beckman and what have you, it's two colours mixing, okay? I'm talking about wet into wet, but in the surface, you have a 
transparent garments and you paint in with pigment into that surface. So I'll show you some examples of the what that what that produces. And again, similar method here. It's just a piece of whiteboard and I painted some paint spray over it and then charcoal spray and then wipe the whole lot down and it's manipulated with a rag with my hand. So there's it's kind of in fact there are pieces in the new painting which uh, except for art and language, I'm one of the only people who actually does finger painting. And he doesn't have to do it because of you know, as you say, ability issues. Uh, and uh, so here's the tool paint. And suddenly I wanted very much to paint paintings about the intimate, paintings that were fragile, paintings that were not demonstrative, that didn't actually you know, uh, involve like sort of German expressionism at the time, mentioning her names, you know, the reconstruction of the ceiling, of the, the healing of the German psyche or any stuff like that. This is about flood in 53. I lived in the South End on the seafront. 103 people died that night. Our house was one of the ones that was flooded. And I just remember as a three or four year old looking at the walls and thinking, because all the windows had been smashed, the sea had come in, all the furniture had got to back in, and there was this tide bar. And all I could think of was shit. Like somebody sprayed the whole ground with shit. And all the adults were crying, and everybody was really upset. And all I could think about was shit. Get it? It was, everything was upside down, life was a bloody mess. Um, anyway, that was, that was, you know, pulled out of the drawer of Proustian flashbacks. This is a little compressed charcoal drawing, it's only A4. Again, it's very much about, and this actually does have a fairly academic sort of thing about the figure ground. If you look up to the top left there, up, the top right, right up there, you'll see there's a shed. Oh, here, the roof of the shed there. Is, see that bit there? There's, there's that, that. That is a stone pipe, that's a building, that's a shadow. And suddenly, another little dawning, probably at the age of about 53 and a half or something, 50, like, no, late 40s, I think. This is a residency up in the northeast of England. And I suddenly realised that shadows, this is, this is what taking me so long, that shadow, within the kind of context of illusionistic, within painting, have as much substance or reality as the objects that cast them. So now I start painting paintings, or I begin to start thinking about painting paintings, <coughs> where shadows are the subject. Now this is really important. The, the subject matter of a lot of the late paintings now is, is, is landscape. That's the subject matter. The content is life. Okay? The idea that I can see. It. And I've got, I'm not ashamed of saying that at the age I'm at, and I, you know, I haven't Choreographs, or I'm uh, very lucky, I can still see. I think that sounds it's like faux honesty, it's not. It's actually the realization that this is an affirmation of painting, is an affirmation of our sense of work. Yeah? The fact that maybe in a shit study, politically or emotionally, is not a matter. But the idea that you wake up one morning and you can see line and, and everything has a kind of cogency, of, uh, of a coherence. Light is what gives it order and meaning, top and bottom, inside, outside, night, day and night. And suddenly, that realisation, that I start making drawings and painting now. Very briefly, this is a nuclear power station, three sheets of paper. It's the one up in the northeast of England, it's a uh, part of Paul or Red Card or somewhere. <coughs> a blank sheet of paper, a sheet of paper that's been cut, so all the whites are absolutely the pristine paper beneath which is compressed charcoal, and then I suddenly I thought, oh, that's, that's not very good drawing, it's not very satisfactory, and I suddenly realised, there's a nuclear power station. And I'd been into the nuclear power station because I'd done all these resonance and steel work. And I suddenly realised the one thing lacking was this sense of kind of being excluded, the idea of security. And so what I did was I took a third sheet of paper and with pen and ink produced a fence. And then I cut out all the squares because I'm a fairly pedestrian mechanistic sort of a character, basically. Uh, and that's who I am, it's not apologies, it's a description. And so I, a third sheet of paper is the fence. I sort of laid it down like a piece of lace work on the front. And suddenly I realised that was what, that's what I needed. It, and I needed it to be, because it made it its own object, it was a laminar, laminated drawing. <coughs> and this is another one, laminated drawing, River Tees. Uh, doing some drawing there, oh god, no, doesn't matter, in the late 90s, well, no, in the early 90s when I was doing a residency, and I took the drawing back, which is ostensibly those branches and stuff, as a reflection, uh, because I, I, I don't know, it's like the rain or something, um, I'm not very good at being outdoors. <laughs> um, 
not as fast as I should be. Uh, anyway, I'll put it away, and then suddenly I went back later on, and I thought, I'll come back to the same spot. And all I could see was sewage floating down the river, right, down this uh, river, the river Thames. And then I, I saw some condoms, and I couldn't stop thinking about money, the water lilies. And I thought, how, how screwed up is that? How messed up is that? Because here I was, looking at the kind of the, the plain, the surface of the water, and you see in the most recent pictures that I've created the idea of uh, things absent by inferring their shadows or their traces. You know, the idea of like uh, the detective or the forensic. You know, oh, there are fingerprints here. Somebody obviously broke in and we've got them on record and all that sort of stuff. So, and so it's, it's, it's collage, it's montage. So the fish is you know, drawn in three pieces and stuck on a piece of weed that was drawn maybe six months before the fish was drawn and so on. Now, this uh, at the time, oh, 10 past 11, so forgive me, I'll whistle on now. You'll be back to that. Um, can you just focus on that? It's just a tiny bit watery. That's it, that's, that's that, no, not that. That's it, leave it, that's fine. Okay. Other painting, it's a monochromatic painting. I, I, I started to say, what's the most marginalised, this is where genre comes back in, what's the most marginalised, despised genre? Uh, yeah, where so it comes to over modernism and kind of why I regard it as sort of uh, slack thinking, you know, um, and consensus. And it's fair painting. Yeah, that is, the word modern does not apply to fair painting, even if you're thinking of day day of And so I painted this other painting, spent but with all the cuttings and the scissors and the rest of it, uh, and then glazed it, and uh, it got discussed I mean, quite, quite extensively in the media, as they say, uh, and it was, it was taking hold of the genre of convention, or you know, form of discourse, as far as I'm concerned, and instead of sort of doing O-level oh, surrealism, we go, oh, I'll, I'll make it really wacky or something, or this will be really you know, it's a, you know, it's a or something. No, what I did, I suddenly realised that if you took something like a convention, and colour, don't forget, is an integral part of flower painting. You think about flower painting, you think about colour, about an affirmation of our relationship and continuity of between nature and the fact it's our day. And it's, it's very much a sort of 16th and 17th century conceit, right? And at the time when we were all a bit worried about the planet and the environment stuff, and it should be, and I didn't want to make didactic paintings, God knows, I've seen enough of those in my time. And, and listen to didactics, the didacticism. And, 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 and somebody thought, hold on, what happens if you take that and you don't use any colour? So what you're doing is you're taking a proposition and you're keeping it one degree out of kilter, one degree out of where you expect to find it. That is really disturbing. I find that much more disturbing than giraffes on fire or watches melting in the midday sort of Andalusian sun. That just looks like a poster that somebody sat in their room in the 60s. And, I, and that same goes for American kind of, of painting of the sublime and all the rest of it. And the field painting, it looks like art for officers. And I, I'm not going to get into that one now, or for toys. This was one in Paso, it's about six foot by five foot. It takes months to do, and this is one of the reasons that I got the RSI painting, the flower paintings. And again, all the pigments will be put here and dragged with decorators' brushes up to there. And then I spend a day or two with a rag, wiping every bit off revealing how the light, as I saw it in my mind's eye, because the whole thing is synthetic. There's no fake photographs, no model, there's no template, except the art historical one that I described. And this is, this is a quite tiny one. You can see the method here, it's about that big this painting. It's just a cloud, rammed in a jar, jam jar, and I've got right, totally kind of uh, crack with the subject, nothing heroic, no big deal. And you can see the actual painting in the background, the paint's put on really thickly, it's called the Winter and other painting white. It's specifically for this purpose, because it dries, it doesn't shrink, it doesn't crack, 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 you know, go that crocodile thing. And let it dry, and then again, pigment from here, wipe down. And again, I, you know, I don't know whether you think it's any good or not, because I don't give a rat's ass about that. What you see here, I'm into I'm in, I'm into this business not because of what it's what, what I'll get out of the approval of mine. Because it's worthwhile, okay? It's why you get up in the morning, because it's worthwhile. It's what you do. <coughs> and, and, I, and as I say, without getting into my background, I come from a background where people didn't have books, and they certainly didn't have bloody paintings, that's for sure. Okay, okay. Uh, and, and going to ask me 68, just a classic one, it was so disproved of, I don't think I've spoken to my 
hole that more than half a dozen times you know you can get it. So this is really important stuff. It makes you other, it makes you different, it, it changes everything. Anyway, so this is a painting. I, I, I'm really I'm really proud of the painting because it's so sort of up you to the kind of orthodoxy and the kind of convention of the day. Can you just also see the little irregularities here? That everything's here, the bushes, yeah, of course, a lot of it's invented, but it's a synthesis of some drawings and photographs, rest of But again, there is a luminosity to this painting, a synthetic sense of its uh, reality or whatever. Uh, but, and, 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 and that that little area there, it's sort of the sort of place where I'd like to be buried, you know, in that kind of daylight, in that kind of light, you think, that is eternity, that's really very nice. Not somewhere to bury a body, somewhere to celebrate. Uh, again, a very similar method, you know, looking at the idea of reduction and painting and the idea of what um, I call uh, not focused on that, but uh, scenes and spores that seem to occupy the air and catch the light. Again, very, very straightforward. You can see all of the other paintings there. And this one is about the idea, again, it's this thing, thing about colour moving around the painting, not being uh, local colour. This is one of the paintings I feel still, it's in the moors about, oh, God knows, it doesn't matter, 15 years ago or something. And this is about culture, the idea of local colour, in the sense that people paint their houses and so It's about the property up very new, the economic, the Celtic Tigers, which is called the Simon Island, this sense of this new economy, this the first time island, that there's, there's some prosperity. Again, you can see the whole thing is painted in the past, though. The only local colour of these, they're, they're very attractive. There's no white in the other painting, and there's, let's get right, the, the white is in the impasto, right? There is no white in any of this painting that you see here. So that is transparent paint spray, as that is transparent cerulean blue, and so on, all right? And that is uh, rose gold over there. Then, of course, as I say, the RSI sets in, and I have some serious decisions about how, how am I going to carry on working? I, I, Try this immediacy, just try sort of with a little bit of local colour on the ground and goofing around. And then suddenly, it suddenly dawns on me that if I put this, I painted the ground that was dry, then I painted the local no, colour, then I put a liquid across the whole surface and painted all of this charcoal grey. It, it, there, you can see up in that bit there, it's transparent. And because this, it was the last thing I did with that lump of paint, does that make sense? So I took the paint. And you'll see in a minute, wherever I painted the stick, I painted the shadow and then the fence post. So the idea of hierarchy of meaning based upon hierarchy of, in a phenomenological way, it, it is broken for me. Again, I think there's a lot of air, there's a lot of light in these pictures. Again, remember the thing about the green and the red, the green and the orange. This painting was given to the Moors, etc., uh, etc., et and it, it was about the, it, basically, it's, it's all in the book, maybe it's a good book for us. Um, it, it's about the dematerialisation, the idea of illusion, what painting can and cannot do, or more correctly, what I can do with painting. This. This is a, I think it's about so big, a small painting. This, believe it or not, is a ostensibly a petrol station, ostensibly the operative word. It's in the west of Ireland, it's on a place called Valencia Island, which sounds like it should be in the Mediterranean, it's not. It's uh, got a slate works, and it's got a couple of sheds, and it, it, there's not even any sheep there, actually, as I remember it. But there was this derelict petrol station, and when I looked in the window, this, there, there were two boxes, and you know when you get cars with boxes, there was a label on the outside say what was in it. And in it, it was Andrex toilet paper and Mars bars. And I thought, that really was amazing. It's the idea that you can see the dietary short circuit there. The idea is what sort of life these people were living <coughs> on Valencia Island before it, it disappeared off the map. And in terms of the petrol farms, it's probably around 1957. Okay, is it all about glazing? Is it all, there's nothing here. Everything is wet into the wet. It, but, but not colour A and colour B together. It's the medium and the pigment, each one of them, put down systematically and glazed. Those solid pieces like that and those pastels of houses, they're painted on the ground, as are the residual puddles from the rain. 
Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> the idea that shadow, that, that's, you, I think you can see straight away that that thing there it looks like it's a well, like an incident mark, isn't that? It's the shadow of this table on top, but it's obscured because of the idea of figure ground treated in a more complex sort of relationship. I, you, you know it after a second, you realise it's outside and then it comes into sight. And that's one of the houses I refer to in William Trevor's excellent book. Yeah. Never read William Trevor, go out and get the collected stories from the Hill Bachelors. It's real David Lynch territory, only it's from Ireland, and it's uh, every little story that you think you didn't think it was great. I didn't think it was great. I didn't think it was great. I killed it. Oh, awful stuff. And there's Cecilia's Journey, or Felicity's Journey. That is one of the darkest, nastiest books you could ever wish to read. If, you know, if you want something that's pretty abject, I mean, quite frankly, I'm okay on the abject, which is why I want to make things that are celebratory, like affirmative. Because when the abject became African orthodoxy, like so much, and I just failed on it. And then the other thing, of course, is about the mobilisation of the rural, and so you gradually get discs and, and, and those automated dustbin collections. Now, remember what I said about the green and the orange? Is that right? Actually, it's Republican terminology, it's green and gold. The good orange is not in the Mexican. Okay, this is in a little village called uh, Hill, somewhere I believe, Hill Kenny. <coughs> it's where they have a pup fair where they stick around up in a tree in a sort of cage looking like it was made in Roman times for three days, can you imagine? And there's a piece of sculpture by um, Head, Blood, oh, Quinn. Martin Quinn. There's this tree, the, the kind of curious, wonderful tree actually. It's about the um, diagram that Origin of Species starts with 10. Darwin. Darwin! Thank you. Yes, Darwin. It's Darwin's first diagrammatic about species. He built that tree there. Right. That's the pill, and there is every, everybody and everything's called Crowley's, every bar, every, everybody practically. And it's, I like, just love this, it's hanging, in, it's hanging in our house today. But what was amazing was to see a shop that actually sold pen loans. A shop that sold pillows in the year 2000. I just say that, oh, I'm in love with this place. This is brilliant. And, and, and they occasionally sell dark blinds and some soft furnishings. You know, and you think, oh, this is, yeah, this is very good now. This is, this is great. One of the things I wanted to draw to your attention formally is the painting of the window. The idea that that's a painting. So everything's localised, the painting underneath. And then there's a glaze over of, of, of paint rack. And wiped the three, four, three or four times. And that has this, so we're talking about minimalism, we're talking about graphic work, because I have a huge collection, by the way, not just of graphic art, but of graphic novels, or call them what you will. Massively, uh, you know, fascinated by the work of Daniel Close, David Small, I go on and on about it. And, uh, but the one thing I had to do here was, this is our sensitive pub, no, this is pub, <coughs> but that, on the other side of this, and this shows you where Ireland was at the time, there was the little shop selling the pillows, right, and, and the candle boxes. And on one side was a bar, that was the classic Guinness logo. And this is true, on the other side was a restaurant. Not any old restaurant, but a macrobiotic restaurant. <laughs> and there, you know, you're doing sort of thumbnail sketch for the spectator about where is Ireland today sort of stuff. Or where was it 10, 10 15 years ago? That's where it was. But of course, the pub was painted orange and the macro bars are up, you won't be surprised to paint it green because of the green has the green. And so I switched them around and for those who have eyes, the green and the white and, and, the, and the gold are the tree colour of, of, of Ireland and the Republican movement. And so, so the idea of, sort of the, symbol, the symbolism of colour, the strength of meaning and the power of colour. <laughs> and I mean, I've painted a whole series of pictures called There Are No Orange Houses because there were no orange houses, not in West Cork. Or you, the brave soul that did that. Anyway, so, and, and here again, this idea of kind of painting the shadow all the time that reveals the figure from the ground. Uh, I, basically, again, this is, this is where I am now, pretty much. These are in a show, I've got a show actually in Dublin, the presence of Uh of, 
And these are all, this is the methods the same. And they have this immediacy, this kind of, that's weird, that's the other place, long way around. Oh, this was about that will of the wisp phenomenon, the idea of lights in the, is it, it, uh, it's a gas? You see it sometimes in marshes and sort of, particularly on people, you know, you see this funny light, it's a certain phenomenon at certain times of the year, it's discharged in electricity. It's, it's not phosphorescence as in the sea. It's a it's, uh, it's gas. It, so methane. It's methane. <coughs> Good, yeah, it is. You're absolutely right. And because it comes from the peace bolts, I mean, methane being part of the whole you know, cycle of vegetative decay. Thank you very much, methane. Take the ride. And I came back to London and I struggled to go with you know, out of what's pain. And I still am. That's this in most recent paper. It's one, but let's say I no longer paint the island, I don't live there anymore. Uh, let's say I just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm at that crossroads again. Listen, that's it, folks. There is a few, oh, you're going in class. <laughs> now, sorry, um, any questions? I think it's a bit of a bar of now. I hope it's worthwhile anyway. <laughs> I've, I've been fretting about it today. And I've been thinking about it for a long time because I'm writing about the work of Anne Brown and Fretting. And I'm writing a lot about what's called post conceptual painting. And I just want to make that clear as well. It's not some clever art, art expression of post conceptual painting. I know because I've lived through the whole body period. And I am post conceptual means people, painters, who have accepted and embraced the legacy of conceptual art, then it's actually made them better painters. Better equipped, rather than going, oh, it's all gone from hand in hand, car. Oh, <coughs> and the brass silver, you know what I mean? You know all that nonsense. No, it's, it's post conceptual painting, it's this idea of synthetic figuration. <coughs> it's embracing who and what we are now. Is that your word? No, it's not. It's all right. I'm going to do it, so I feel like. Mine. Oh, oh, oh! You mean numbers sort of, uh, if I start at one? <laughs> Do you mean ten painting? Ten painting who I, I'll tell you what, I curate a lot of, okay, yeah, I, all right. I curate a lot of shows and have curated a lot of that. And I don't forget, I was a professional painter for a lot of those of So I was there from the mid-90s to the mid-40s when I suddenly thought, I can't want to deal with politics and higher education. I want to wake up and not sort of have, what you say, um, Called IBS, Drupal House. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of people are arguing about painting. I don't want my head back, and I'm going to be able to do work, painting, or a dice. Yeah, so I've been making a lot of shows and thought a lot about those issues. And one, I'll tell you what, if you go to my website, there is a answer to that question. It's on the website in manifold terms. And it's a little show I curated in Drogon. It's a big road between Belfast and Dublin. It's the site of the Battle of the Boyne, so as I know, the Seven Heads, Patrick, um, all of our news. Thank you! Ha 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 ha! Good man. It's, sort of, sort of, it's, is it the same old company? Yes, well, yes, yes, yes. And you know what his sin was? Not only did he open a school to both Catholics and Protestants, but he opened it for girls as well. What? Oh, sorry, that's, that's imperialism in one of the other countries. What would that call the politics of Right, in that show, now this has got a great deal of rain on that show, so it's not about one how it looks, right? You know, it's quite often, I mean, I've looked into it, I've got all the Marmite catalogs, I mean, I've, if it's painted, I don't want to get it, so I know what the pretty much is happening, as anybody of my age or your age. Right? Um, and there is a, in fact, I'm not going to mention any names, there's one thing that Fred Meade promised a few years ago when two people, one people specific than that, showed the whole show. And guess what? It looked like a one person show of the two people's work fused into this third personality. So what they chose was what they liked. Okay? Now, I curate stuff not because I like it, because I, 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 I do crits for Zap down in New Cross and stuff like that, so I see lots of people. And I decided that if you take 
quite like that illustration. You know, the idea, I like it, but I don't. But I quite like this suit, because well I've on today. I quite like robes, because I feel insecure about style. I have to wear classes, because I'll look out of fashion. Get it? Okay, so put all that crap aside. When it comes to what I think about, or the things I would suggest to share with the group, are in the show called Precious Things. It was a high lanes gallery. I wrote a piece, and it's just basically three lines about post conceptual banking. And here, it's about the legacy. These people who became aware, mindful of the legacy of conceptual art. Okay? Who, who actually found it empowering. Not the word of the it's been debated by the political class, but you know what I mean, it's enabling. It makes it more sad about what's going on. And in that show, and in no particular order, the father car of honor, who I think is cracking that show. Yeah? Simon Bill. Who, uh, okay, just, you just make a note and you'll find out those people have nothing in common and their work certainly doesn't look like mine. I don't know about patronising people who look like me, it might be better than me doing what I do. So, no, I don't do that. Uh, um, I'm not going to embarrass the guy at the back because he's obviously, I think, highly of his paintings, which is why I've written about them recently. Um, John Strutton, I think John Strutton, who is the senior chief of the World Wide Job, and who I must admit, you know, who, Sanity, I point him out, one of the best things I ever did is a tutorial. He runs a thing called Band of Nod with George Shaw, who incidentally I think is a, a, a fascinating and very relevant painter. Um, George is also in the reality show in Norwich. Um, so, Clark Pagano, Simon Bill, very different reasons. And Simon, he is, he epitomizes the sort of position of post conception. He's embraced it and informs everything he does. Even to the shape of his paintings, they're not rectangular, <coughs> his paintings, so many paintings a year is serious. So we're closer to the work of Onkawara, conceptual artist at the time, pre Walter to Maria. Onkawara, who is influenced actually people like James White, who I rate very, very highly in the who's uh, one of the sort of contemporary, takes a monotone, exclusively James was present anyway. And his work, and I know James, a lot of people of that generation, are influenced by the ideas and the thinking of Onkawara. Not what Onkawara's work looked like, right? But the way that he would make these little paintings of just the day. And he did it every day for one year of 1972-73. And then at a certain time of day, every time he woke up, the time he could work without me using a long of course. Oh, the chief's winter, I'm so tired sort of part of his painting. He made note of that and, and did a painting. And it's just a statement, white lettering on black. Okay? So the idea that this filters through, that it's not a threat, it actually is it's empowering, it's enabling. It's how I think about my work, but I also, I mean, sorry, I've also embraced work from the Cento. I mean, I, I, I was knocked out when I first stood in front of the Lights of France, I was in San Francisco, and I thought, oh, it's all been done, I'm dead, I'm religious groups. And there it was, the Lights of France. I just was in flux of tears. I never I cried. Yes, it's the birth of my kids. That was the idea. I've cried since I was a baby at school, sort of stuff, or you know, lost my bus fare or whatever. Uh, and then I tried to fix the same holiday, it's called cool. to give it to literary connections. Uh, who else was in that show? Will Daniels. Now there's an interesting fact. Very interesting. Or the synthetic figuration. Very much fun to myself in the no, 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 hold on, no, 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 uh, no, it's not the real Daniel Tuggins. No. Now, if they go to that show, you'll see all the pictures are on that side. Uh, it's from models. Yes, it does. Yeah, yes. No, so he yeah, take, take a kind of um, Castaway tree, you know, the two trees, or that sort of, not the not, not ones without figures, basically. And the two trees. He makes a little cardboard model, a uh, corrugated cardboard, and then look at there, and it makes it like it's still alive. But of course, it's loaded, it's ready. You know, you look at it, and if you've got an old level in art history, or the observers, you know, the girls' book of art history, you'll know it's kind of, that's a freedom. And that sort of like, it's not, that's not the end of it, it's the way he does it. Because his painting is not, it's not photographic, it's not metic, or any type of sort of descriptive. Um, it's why I enjoy, you know, things like the, the work of Jack Demons, for instance. Because they harnessed this idea, and I was one of the guys who used to make modern world and scenery as it is. Yeah. Bit of a loner, which is why I like the idea of making lighthouses out of matchsticks. 
that's scary and obsessive compulsive, rather than coming at you with a kind of, oh, 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 oh I'm really annoyed you quite profoundly now. No, you're not. That is rhetoric. Don't you think you're kidding? You decided to do that on Monday. You're still doing it in 20, 30 years, 20 no man down the line. Who the hell do you think you're kidding about authenticity? You choose this. Don't, don't, don't make out this is underpinned by authenticity. That is choice. And that was, that was the lurking thing that started. The idea of, and again, don't get this line. Yeah, it's, it's this thing about the hardest thing to do is not is to realise that we're not perceiving ourselves. Really difficult. And I try very hard to be open hearted and transparent because I'm sick to death of the opacity that has been appropriated by the marketing. You know, and which is why I don't use the word like, which is why I don't like art. But it's not important, I get it? I love painting. And without it, I'd probably be in jail. <laughs> or in the field. Yes? Oh yes, yes, there were two of them. The first one was had the rather wonderful, wonderful title Devoted to Space, which is a bit, a bit of a grand element of the leg. I'm saying, there's of course this reference is the work of Black. You know, whereas the other one was peripheral vision was about peripheral vision. One thing I do before you finish the question, they were about reciprocity. The idea of you know when a train goes by you wave it, you get obliged to wave with the kids in the field. You do it. It's an act of generosity. But that generosity is about empathy, it's about reciprocity. Which is why I'm also writing about the work of Hannah Brown, who I wrote really like Hannah Brown, paintings that are like clamped down so tight. Don't let her get old scissors, you know what I mean? Ooh. Ooh. Uh, and, and her sculpture. Jesus, where did that come from? I mean, yeah, if you know about the sound, we're writing a thing about Silverback Rabbits, which is that wonderful 50s kitchen of little green rabbits. That, and tumors, and the work of Franz West, and mm -hmm. um, Bill Turnbull, the top Sorry, finish your question. No, I'm bored of it. The little excerpt you mentioned is the book. Oh, well, the book, yes. It's called Poetics of Space, and it's by a French poet. You Google Gaston Bastion, first thing you see is the bloke looks like a fuser. Who the hell is that? Because you expect him to look kind of Parisian or a little bit sick as a French. But he's not, he's a real old monk. He was a writer on, he is the great, he's the great inspiration behind Foucault's writing. He is Foucault's kind of star, he's, you know, he's mental. Gaston, G-A-S-T-O-N, Bachelard, B-A-C-H-E-L-A-R-D, I think. Yeah, look some other club. I was just going to say, it, it, listen, it should never be out of print, you know, it's like, it's that good. But the essay, I mean, not read the whole damn thing, but just read from the garret to the attic, I think this was the first essay in it. But the other thing about Gaston Bachelard, not only did he influence um, Bishop Foucault, who I, I'm writing a lot about Foucault at present, about things called Petrotopia, because that's what most of my work, I'm very much saying, you know, over time as it is. But if you Google Petrotopia, I've used that in terms of the work of Jane Ward, who uses computer generated collage. So she'll make a street, a, 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 a phone box, out of canary wood, everything crushed in and atomized. And so a field that looks like a field of wheat is made out of um, lampposts or something. Do you know what I mean? So the scale of the image. And, and the I'm not going to get into the definition of heterotopia. You go away and do your own kind of work. But the idea, that's why I'm writing a new book on the because the idea of heterotopia is absolutely one of those wonderful It's basically, it's, 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 it's the sense of place that we carry. You don't have to refer to Proust any longer. You give it a kind of less or burst Right? And it's called Poetics of Space. And it's, it's really clever. It's like yesterday. You know when you suddenly eat a, you first see a clash or something, you first talk to beef up, right? It's one of those moments. Okay. I've got one last question. Yeah, it, have you got a question or will you just want to be excused? No. <laughs> okay, go on. You go first. Oh, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. One of those. Oh, Afi. Afi, yeah, it says. Um, one of the things which uh, I thought was uh, amazing, as the last one met, the, the way you were talking about uh, building a new, a new studio. Oh, yes. Uh, and sort of, and, and thinking ahead and, and saying that, um, you know, look at the future and 
making making your, your best work in the future. Yeah. So it hasn't happened yet. Um, well, I hope so. Otherwise, they're not very hard. Uh, and I, uh, I really like this idea of um, <coughs> practice being a sort of one project. You know, oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's so, not it's not five years, but it's it's this big project. I mean, um, but with that in mind, um, you know what 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 um, it's probably an unfair question. But what what advice do you give people who are in a situation where they have they don't have that project, but they have the next few years, they have the next year. What about in translating their ideas into making work? Get up earlier, drink less, can't be done. I mean, you know, I'm totally referring to Stoner and Old Acid here. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm the last one to talk. But I, I, I've got a tiny version, tiny, well, from where I'm sitting, I know where you're sitting because I've been there, but it was 45, 50 years ago. And uh, it's hard to reconcile that. But there is so much to find out. And, and, and basically, if you want advice, is don't stick to the script about success. The success, you know, the idea that if you go role model yourself on YBA, yeah, that train left 20 years ago. Right? Okay. Think about, think, think about and as somebody said one day there was a, we were interviewing people at the Royal College of Art, and I was the, 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 the big France here, a guy who wrote a great book on Leger, cross between Jacques Tati and Karl Marx, if you they're absolutely good. They're one of the best books on it. Uh, somebody came in, and Anthony Green was in the room as well. The guy just very simple. And he's just white and advanced. Wonderful. He's still quite a good guy, and I think it's kind of too beautiful. Um, and this guy came in, and he said, Isn't it wonderful to see someone who realised there was German painting before then? And he said, Yeah, there was. <laughs> but I, so somebody said to me, who should you watch you know, what historically changed everything? It was the real of the subject who's standing in his, uh, uh, the Capella de uh, Santa Maria and Palmine, the Grand Arts Chapel, right? Okay. And you see the archaic and the Renaissance. From Christian iconography to the humans. And what that means is instead of Godhead at the centre and everybody else just being supplicant and sort of objectified, you've got people shivering waiting to be baptized. You've got humanity. The idea of empathy is at the centre of the project. Uh, advice. I mean, there are no recipes. All I'm saying is stay clear of, you know, what you see in um, Kunz Colors in Dusseldorf or read about what was there last week. Or because, you know, art and art is okay. It's all right. I, 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 but success is the thing that's corrosive. The idea that you think that there is a way Successful. And self realization is, is sorry, self realization is the answer to your question. Self fulfillment. <coughs> and sticking, sticking to an Aristotelian problem. So, reading one of the books, you can go away and read, but it just changes in 180 degrees the contemporary sort of um, writing. It, it, it's a book by a woman called Jenny Hugo, and it's from Nature's Engraver. It's a biography of Thomas Brewer, <coughs> the guy who I mentioned. Okay, so who, who can actually say, oh, I know the work of Tom's view? Hands up. Yeah, brilliant, see? That's something you've learned today. Yeah. Exactly. Thomas view, Jenny Hugo, the way she approaches art history, the way she approaches, and the way Thomas view, who quite frankly had nothing, and um, he's probably the most influential British artist you've never heard of. Okay? It's like the stuff of Nore. Yeah? I mean, Nore is, is the, the kind of Dalton Library, it's where the BBC, it's where every documentary format just goes to their picture of 19th century urban poverty. It's it and illustrated Dickens as well, which is really important. Um, I'll tell you one of the things that I think is that a lot of people don't embrace, and I, I don't know how many there are, but that I found massively useful career, well just to get to, you know, get to equalize, is resonance and engaging, I mean, some of the most moving and exciting work I've done have been, been um, in the North East, within a group of people with, uh, with, with learning, uh, with learning issues, the challenge and other stuff. And uh, if I say much more about it, I'll cry about it. But it was that good, okay? <coughs> oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Oh, 